This was the uh, control room, if you want to call it a control room. Um, and when Dow Jones first started, the 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 mix position was over here. It was a coffee table with a Tascam Model 5B 8-channel mixer, uh, and then a TAC uh, 3340 um, 4-track recorder. And all of Hoosier Hysteria was done on that. Uh, set up and then that became really popular that album became really popular and we made enough money between that and doing a whole bunch of other punk bands and some commercial clients and things like that they could buy a half inch eight track recorder and at that point we were like it <laughs> you know we had arrived this is at the dawn of time when nobody on the planet is actually um, you know able to do this because the equipment is a really expensive and there's not many people I figured out how to do it and all that sort of stuff and Brad and I were really into it. I don't know if you can see this, but right down there I can see myself. But when I look at myself, I can't see myself back unless I look right there. This area here, you know, lots of things happened. Um, uh, one of my favorite stories to tell is I came down here one night and Brad and um, Greg had decided to make the world's longest tape loop. You know what a tape loop is? Um, so there's this process of, of you run the tape past the playback and the record head and then you take it out of the tape recorder and you put it around mic stands and things like that. And so whatever gets recorded on it goes all around the loop and then comes back and plays and gets recorded again on another machine. Um, so they wanted to set up the world's longest tape loop, so I came down here and they had every single mic stand we owned and table leg and everything else, and they had this thing running so it was like an hour's, a whole reel's worth of tape <laughs> running around the room. <laughs> and that ran for like several days or something, I don't, and I don't know where the recording is, you'll have to ask Brad where the recording is, but there was always that sort of bizarre experimentation. One time we got a cassette deck and the cassette deck, uh, we, we had to borrow a cassette deck because ours broke but the cassette deck had a pitch knob on it. Well, that was like a week's worth of experimentation right there, just like recording and turning the pitch knob and hearing all this, you know, and seeing what we could do just with a pitch knob in terms of making funny sounds, yeah? So, sorry the, uh, uh, the tour gets so long here. So, um, all of this has, you know, been remodeled since. Um, that staircase is pretty much as it is, minus the carpeting on the thing. Um, I've never remodeled the, this. You come in here, um, and that this door is exactly like it was because I just haven't gotten around to remodeling this part And there's a small room in here and that room is called the boom boom room um, Because the people who had lived here before had put mirrored tiles on the ceiling and um, um, there, It was a, just known for being a party place uh, Well, it became our recording room and um, Greg Horn the guitar player lived down here on top of that so he would have to move his stuff out and the band would move their stuff in he didn't have a whole lot of stuff anyways he wasn't interested in a lot of stuff and so you know the whole thing with with this room was the corner leak down there in the in the bottom um and um water would come in and so we he had a carpet pad and then he had a piece of carpeting over it and then he would add uh, every time that got wet, he would just add another layer of carpeting <laughs> rather than dry it out or anything like that. So you can imagine the mold smell in here is like, and then you get the mold smell and then you get a punk rock band like in the middle of the summer who um, um, probably, you know, hadn't showered recently anyways. And this place could really start smelling like <laughs> ripe. And, and it was only about a 10 foot by 10 foot room where you had a full drum kit, you know, bass, Always at least one bass and one guitar, you know, playing, you know, so, so it actually came to about, you know, the room was actually from about here to about here, I would say, um, and, um, and we had put up burlap and fiberglass, you know, to, to as much as possible deaden the walls, which of course does nothing for the low end, so all of our old recordings, you know, uh, Paul Mayern has, uh, 
um, fixed up some of them um, and he's done a really good job it's, it's pretty amazing um, they had all sorts of low-end problems you know because depending on where you put the mic the low frequency response is very different we just barely barely had tone controls on our mixer you know we didn't have any parametric equalizers and all that you know stuff on each channel or anything like that you know <clears throat> it, it has a real garage band quality to it we were figuring out what we did as we went along. Um, all of the drums would always get recorded with four mics. There was an overhead pair over the drummer's head uh, that would pick up the stereo of the mic of the drums, and then there was a drum on the a mic on the kick drum, and then a mic that split its time between the hi hat and the snare, and um, and that was it. Um, we didn't we didn't own any more mics, <laughs> you know, so that yeah. and. Um, I, I had two dynamic mics we used as overheads that were you know pretty good but they were um, they're AKG 224s um, they were not you know not anything anybody would actually consider using they would ever you know use a condenser mic or something like that and um, the snare was uh, SM57 SM58 I'm not sure which but a standard snare you know hi-hat mic and the kick we bought a, a Sennheiser MD-224, I think it was, um, out of our enormous, you know, winnings. <laughs> we, we never made a cent out of the studio. We just had an agreement that, you know, we're going to just build the studio and every cent that we got, you know, that came in, we just put it back in the studio and buy more stuff, you know. And that's how we lived for, I don't know, I can't, I don't remember how long Brad and I were together, but it was at least, you know, six, seven, eight years, something like that. Um, that we that we did this. I kept the studio. Uh, Brad decided that he wanted to. Uh, he finally got up the courage and decided he wanted to go into computer music full time. And he went to Columbia University, where he studied with uh, Paul Anske. Not Columbia University. He went to Princeton University, where he studied with like really famous people like Paul Anske and Milton Babbitt and people like that. And uh, got his uh, um, uh, PhD and then got a position at Columbia University and he's been head of the computer music program there which is like a world famous computer music program and he's been there ever since. Um, <clears throat> I stayed here, we call it the divorce because we had to split all the equipment up. <laughs> So he got the DCM time windows, uh, and uh, I got I got a few things, um, and uh, I decided you know decided I was going to keep the studio for a while because um, I still had a lot of people. So that's what I met Carrie Newcomer and uh, did um, the first three albums, but then she went. She moved to Bloomington, sort of right in the middle of the third album, and cut about half that album down there. And then she's, you know, gone on to become world famous. But the band then was Stone Soup, um, and uh, um, that occupied a lot of time. They sort of became my house group of um, what the late 80s, and then in the early 90s, there was a band called Stiff Kitten with Stan Shannon Hoon, and I had a student who was their manager, and that had Mike Kelsey in it, and that lasted in town here a very short time, like it was one summer, but it just like totally took over this town. Um, and so I ran around with them, and I made a couple recordings with them that not anything fancy but we were we're always going to record an album here and then the band broke up you know over <laughs> you know I don't know if it was artistic differences or what it was at the time but Shannon went to California and the rest is history with Blind Melon and, um, and his story and of course Mike Kelsey is a living legend in Lafayette and many other places you know so um, I've, I've, I've been able to work with Mike uh, a bunch of times afterwards we did a punk rock musical with Mass Giorgini um, in the early 90s called Awakening. Uh, that was perhaps another, you know, sort of small moment in time that um, uh, the punk community came together in Lafayette in just an amazing way. But Mike played guitar on it. Uh, um, Dan, I forget Dan's last name, uh, played drums. Um, Mass's um, uh, friend who's like this most amazing drummer on the planet. And Mass had a studio over on 5th Street, I think it was at the time. And um, he was producing stuff. And he had, he had taken one of my classes. I'm sorry, I'm going off the, <laughs> on a tangent. He had taken one of my classes. And the minute he walked into the class, I just knew that this guy was some, something special, right? But somewhere in the mid-90s, I got... You know, I got a lot busier composing scores, and I got, you know, a lot more work elsewhere, and I just, 
started realizing I just really wanted to focus on my own work. And you know, since then, I, the studio just went away. Um, now we have this incredible studio over at Purdue anyways. Um, so I get, still get to <laughs> interface with bands and, the, uh, and a lot of different genres now because it's a really good studio. So we get, you know, we do get punk, you know, but we get pop and we get, you know, sort of country and um, jazz and all sorts of different styles over there. So that's, it's been very cool. These are definitely mic stands that we use from the period. Um, these are newer ones. Um, this is definitely from the period. I had one guy once recorded down here and then left his drum kit behind. <laughs> and at, at three years later, I just couldn't have any room for it. I had another guy who uh, left a Fender Twin Reverb for two years here. And um, then he uh, appeared one day and asked for it. And I still had it, so he, I gave it to him. There is a uh, somewhere in here. Yeah, here it is. We did a band called the Board Cops. Have you ever heard of them? Um, they're, <laughs> they're still a symbol. <laughs> it was like, dude, come and get your symbol. <laughs> This is the snake we used right here. <clears throat> this is a custom built snake because, you know, Whirlwind and all those companies weren't around. So my friend Maury Modridge, <laughs> Zound Snake, who was the uh, chief engineer at the radio station, WBAA, um, helped me make this in our, <laughs> our spare time because <laughs> he was really into the idea that we were, you know, making all these recordings and that sort of stuff. Um, and so that just, you know, that we just ran a cable from here all the way over to there. And there was, you know, there was nothing deluxe or fancy about anything we did. It was just, we did what we could. 